if countries around the world, including China, realize that by arbitrarily arresting random Canadians, they can get what they want out of Canada politically, well, that makes an awful lot more Canadians who travel around the world vulnerable to that kind of pressure. Hi there, and welcome to Power and Politics. I'm Vashi Capellos. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is rejecting calls to step in and end the extradition case against Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. What you just heard from him there is in response to our exclusive story last night about a letter from former MPs, senators, and diplomats urging the government to do just that, end the Huawei extradition case in an effort to free two Canadians detained in China. Tonight, we're going to get reaction from the family of one of those Canadians. Michael Kovrig's wife, Vina Najibula, will join us to speak about what action she wants the government to take. The feds announced new details as well today on help for students. We're going to ask the minister in charge if that help goes far enough. And we'll take you to BC for a live update on the spread of COVID-19 in that province a bit later in the show. But we begin tonight again with that letter. 19 former politicians and diplomats are calling on Justin Trudeau to end the Huawei extradition case in an effort to free two Canadians detained by China. Prime Minister, the Prime Minister, I should say, slammed the door on that idea this morning. I respect the distinguished Canadians who put forward uh, uh, that letter, uh, but I deeply disagree with them. The idea of solving a short-term situation uh, by creating a precedent that demonstrates to China that all they or another country has to do is randomly arrest a handful of Canadians to put political pressure on a government to do what we want, even uh, by going against the independence of our justice system, would endanger the millions of Canadians who live and travel overseas every single year. Canadians Michael Spaver and Michael Kovrick have now spent more than 560 days in custody. They were formally charged with espionage by Chinese officials last week. China has provided no evidence to back up those charges, but it's almost a certainty based on previous cases that they will lead to convictions. Kovrick and Spaver were detained just days after Canada arrested Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou in Vancouver at the request of the U.S. government. Their detainment is widely considered retaliation for Meng's arrest. Joining me now is the wife of Michael Kovrig, Vina Najibula. She's in Toronto. Hi, Vina. Good to see you. Thank you very much for making time for us. Uh, good to see you as well. Thank you for having me on your show. You spoke publicly uh, Monday for the first time during this 560 plus day ordeal. There's been a lot of reaction to what you said and, and what your what family members have said since then. How are you and Michael's family doing? Um, well, it has been a an intense and difficult week in uh, what has been an intense and difficult 564 days. Um, but we are grateful for the support that we have received. Um, I have uh, gotten messages on all of my social media platforms from Canadians from around the country saying that they care about our Michael and Michael Spavor, that they are standing with us and that they hope they can be brought home as soon as possible. I think um, the message and the pain and the, the prolonged nature of all of this um, has really um, hit home for many Canadians, and uh, we are grateful for that support. I listened very closely to what you said, and I know in the first or the first question, at least, that aired was about your timing, about deciding to speak out. Are you? Are you, I know that it took a long time for you to decide to decide to do so. Are you glad that you did? Uh, absolutely, Vashi. I feel that in the last few days, we have moved the conversation forward. We wanted to create a dialogue, and that is exactly what we have. In the last few days, there is now a deeper understanding, in my view, of what the Canadian uh, legal environment looks like. There's a more sophisticated understanding of the Extradition Act and the authority of the minister. I think everybody now understands that the authority is there. The question then becomes, should that authority be exercised? And that is precisely the conversation we wanted to have. We wanted to get out of a stalemate of this notion that, well, there is the rule of law and the two Michaels are in jail and nothing can really be done. Um, that was no longer acceptable given everything that has happened and everything that we've highlighted this week. And the fact that we're now having 
a real conversation about the complexities of this case, about the fact that there is no easy solution, and we have to exercise political judgment. And by that, I mean the government has to exercise political judgment in finding a way forward and not just say rule of law prohibits us from doing anything. Because, in fact, the Canadian extradition environment the role of the Minister of Justice is very much hands-on. He has the full control of the process. In fact, he has the responsibility to control that process. In this particular extradition case, has gone on for too long, has a lot of complexities and a lot of unanswered questions around it, and it is only natural for us to raise them at this point. I want to ask you about what you just mentioned, because you're right when you say that that conversation has certainly expanded in the last few days. And I just want to make sure our audience is familiar with what they've been hearing on this show, for sure, but I think what you're referring to, we've got, for example, this letter that became public last night, 19 you know, very prominent political figures right across the political spectrum, uh, calling specifically on the prime minister to essentially act on a legal opinion that you, among uh, others, solicited and sent to the prime minister back. I think it was on May 22nd. And what that legal opinion says is that the minister of justice doesn't have to wait until the end of this process, as he has said he would do to intervene or to make a decision on whether or not to intervene. He can do so at any point without without specifying even a reason at, at his at his own will. Uh, and that would include, you know, right now, a month from now, a month ago, that kind of thing. That letter that I described, uh, Vina, isn't just saying that he can do it. It's saying that he should do it. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. What I also agree with is that the government should be considering all options. This is one very specific proposal that is both lawful and can be executed. Of course, there are elements that have to be managed, the relationship with the U.S., the perception of China. Those elements can be managed, but it is a path forward, which is far more than we've had for 564 days. Um, I, I'm, so thank you for explaining the background of that letter. And I also want to add that um, since that letter became public, there have been other very... Um, distinguished Canadians who have shared the same perspective uh, with me and others privately. So the list is far longer than 19 people. Is there is there anyone who you're willing to say publicly did? No, but essentially what I'm trying to say right. is that this conversation didn't just happen yesterday. It's not just these very prominent and distinguished uh, Canadians. There are many others who've been looking at this case for a while and wondering why is this still continuing? So let me put to you uh, what the prime minister said today, because he was asked very specifically about the letter. He said he has a lot of respect for the people who signed their names to it, but fundamentally he disagrees. And the position that he put forth was that if the government were to do this, as described in the letter, they would be handing China leverage and saying to them effectively, or endangering other Canadians and saying to them effectively, if you hold these two men hostage, we will acquiesce. What is your response to that? I disagree. I believe that um, the prime minister makes an important point that we need to protect Canadians today and in the future. I believe that can be done, and it doesn't have to be an either-or situation. Michael's detention, both our Michael and Michael Spower's detention, is arbitrary, but it is not random. It's important for us to recognize how this all came about. China reacted to something that happened here first on December 1. So it's not that somehow if we were to now decide on the merits of the extradition case itself that it should not continue, that in fact it may have not even, should have not even proceeded to begin with, but fine, 560 some odd days later we can say we can stop it, that that somehow will then influence Chinese behavior in the future to me is not a prediction that I'm comfortable to make. In fact, if anything, history shows us that what we do in this kind of situation, and we've been here before with the Garrett's case, does not necessarily dictate what China will do in the future. On that case, it continued for two and a half years. Kevin Garrett's was in Chinese jail for that amount of time. Um, we didn't acquiesce, and China has done this again. Um, I don't fundamentally believe that that is reason not to act and not to consider options. Do you think there is any way that uh, your Michael will be freed without something like this happening? Listen, I have hope, and I have been working for the last 564 days on every option. Um, I believe that this is not a simple situation. 
the answer is going to be complex. But what I also believe is that we don't have the luxury of dismissing lawful potential options forward if, without at least providing something else. Like, I can appreciate why people say that uh, there will be challenges with this particular option. I agree. But what is an alternative? Has the government conveyed, and, and I listened to your interview with Adrian, and you said you had been in you know, many, many talks and conversations with them over this period of time. Have they conveyed to you any alternative action plan? The government has been committed to this since the beginning, which I, we very much appreciate, and I and other members of the family were grateful. It has been a priority. And yet, 564 days later, nothing fundamentally has changed. Uh, Michael remains in jail. Michael Spavor remains in jail. I believe options are being explored, but none of them have so far resulted um, in what we want, which is to essentially have secured the release of both Michaels. One of the signatories to the letter, former Senator Hugh Siegel, was on the program last night, and he was particularly, it, it appeared to me, and he conveyed to our audience, uh, it, it seemed like he was particularly bothered by the fact that you had not received a response to that legal opinion that, that I mentioned earlier was delivered on May 22nd. He called it actually arrogant. Uh, have you received any response at all in, in, the, in the past few days to this? And, and if not, how do you feel about that? Uh, well, to be clear, the letter was sent to the Minister of Justice, Minister Lametti, and uh, others in government. And uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Prime Minister's Office, those folks I am in regular contact with, and of course they've acknowledged uh, the receipt of the um, of the legal opinion and the letters and so forth. Um, the issue is with the Justice Ministry, and there there has been silence only. It really didn't sound today like the Prime Minister was going to do what is laid out in the in the legal opinion and and and, and forced through or emphasized through the letter uh, signed by those 19 individuals. He was. I think I, I listen to him, you know, every time he talks about China, and it sounded to me like he was very specific. He was explicit today, using a kind of language that I don't know if I've heard exactly before, the, the sort of gist of it I have, but maybe not the specific language. Uh, and I'm just wondering how, how you perceive that, and if, and, and, and if you are, if, if that sort of makes you feel less hopeful that they'll pursue it, or how, how you feel about it, basically. Oh, I try to remain optimistic. Uh, I believe that we have no option but to continue to pursue every avenue available to us to secure Michael's freedom. Uh, the alternative is to essentially give up and say, in order to preserve safety of Canadians in the future from possible harm, we have to accept the fact that our Michael and Michael's power will have to languish in jail for many, many years to come. I cannot accept that. That is simply not a proposition I'm willing to accept. I believe there is a way for us to secure the freedom of both Michaels and to do it in a way that does not jeopardize Canadians in the future. There are ways to address risks in the future through travel advisory, through um, coalitions of other member states to look at arbitrary detention and hostage diplomacy as an issue on a multilateral level. I believe future risks can be managed. But the reality that Michael is under today has to be looked at very, very closely. And that has to come to an end. As I said earlier, there is no easy solution here. There is not a solution that will satisfy everyone and will cost nothing. The question really then becomes, who has to pay the highest price? And currently, our Michael and Michael Spavor are paying that price. They have been paying that price for 564 days. And we cannot simply say, we will do what we can and they're a priority. Words are not enough. We need actions. We need real proposals to move forward. Distinguished Canadians have put some options forward. They need to be considered. If they are rejected, alternatives have to be put forward. What we cannot afford is to say the status quo is okay. This is too late. Um, some folks have said to me, well, if we had done this thing with the extradition 500 days ago, that would have been okay, but now it's too late. Well, it's never too late to end unjust human suffering, and better late than never. And Michael and Michael Spavor are unjustly suffering, and they have been doing that for 564 days. Michael's last consular visit, I believe, was January 14th. The Chinese said, following your interview, that they were uh, considering, at the, I think it was at, quote, the right time, resuming those visits, which was certainly a change uh, in posture from them. Have you heard anything more on that? 
Uh, no, but uh, I know that our embassy and Ambassador Barton in particular are working tirelessly on that. They, they, they have made that a priority. I, we've been assured that they're essentially doing everything they can, um, short of camping out from the, outside the detention center, which I think Ambassador Barton may do because he's that committed to getting um, a visit. Um, so we are hopeful, but then, of course, uh, it's been six months. You also, another thing that really stuck out to me in that interview was talking about uh, his letters and how you used to get once a, one a month, but they had seized, uh, as I think March was the last one that you said. Has anything there changed? Yes, so um, perhaps completely coincidentally, but uh, we received a letter uh, just on Wednesday. Uh, so, uh, and it was the first one since the March communication you mentioned. Um, Michael wrote them in the beginning of June. Um, and it's clear from the tone of these letters that um, he feels especially frustrated with the um, with the lack of information. He's not received our letters from April and May. Uh, he received the March letter at the end of May, right before writing these letters. So there's been even less information that he normally gets, and um, his spirit seemed a bit lower, which. Um, which is very hard for us, obviously. Yeah, I was going to ask you because uh, you were reading the letter in that interview, and it was it was it was tough to hear. And I can't imagine. I was very curious to find out what he could convey to you because this would have been the first time that you'd heard anything from him in any capacity in a long time. Yes, I mean he he is incredible, and he uses these letters, I think, also as an opportunity to process his own thoughts and to share the immediate experience of what it's like to be confined, to be so isolated, to, to have been confined for 564 days. Uh, Michael is someone who, as a diplomat, as an analyst, was extremely connected to what's happening in the world. So to all of a sudden find yourself in a 10 by 10 cell for 564 days, not knowing what will happen to your fate, is incredibly difficult. And he is handling that situation with so much courage and and that is ultimately what drives me to do everything that we've been doing and everything that we've even been doing this week. It's not been easy to speak publicly. It's um, it's taking a toll, but it's what we need to do to move the conversation forward. Um, there has to be more complexity, more nuance, uh, and more options put forward for how we're going to resolve this. We cannot wait for the judge in Vancouver to do something. That process is going to take years. We cannot hope that our allies will come to our rescue. This is the time for Canada to stand up for Canadians, for Canadian government to exercise its sovereign responsibility to protect its citizens in harm's way. And two of them are in a dire circumstance, and we need the government to do something more and now. Okay, I'm out of time. I'm going to leave it there. I don't know if it's any comfort, but my inbox is inundated with Canadians, regardless of their political affiliation, who are thinking of, of both Michaels and you and your family. And uh, I know that a lot of people are, are honestly, truly, I get so many messages from people who are heartbroken over what they are going through and what you are going through. Thank you so much, Vashi. And thank you for keeping the spotlight on this issue. We really, really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks a lot for your time, Vina. Bye-bye. Welcome back to Power and Politics. As we told you first last evening, 19 former politicians and diplomats are urging Ottawa to intervene in the extradition case of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou in order to secure the return of Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver from China. We just heard from Vina Najibula, Michael Kovrig's wife, about why she wants the government to pursue that course of action. But the Prime Minister today rejected the approach, and he's not alone. Ujjal Desange is a former Premier and Attorney General of BC. He joins us from Vancouver. Hi, Mr. Desange. Good to see you again. Good to see you. I wanted to interview you today because I saw on Twitter, we had posted a clip last night about the letter that was written advocating for that position, and you retweeted it saying, respectfully, I am shocked and embarrassed. Why is that? Well, you have uh, 19 very prominent uh, and respectable Canadians uh, essentially pulling the rug from under the government's feet in terms of its capacity to negotiate and pressure the Chinese government. Um, you know, Chinese aren't a, demo aren't a democracy, and, and they function in a particular way when they, when they know that, uh, that uh, the government's own people, very prominent Canadians, are undermining the government's position, um, it only emboldens them.
And uh, I was shocked and embarrassed both for that reason as well as the fact that we are a law-abiding country. Either we admit what we did was wrong in the first place uh, by arresting Meng, or uh, we carry through with the rule of law and the process that we've initiated. For someone to say that the um, Attorney General has the right to stop this process any time. You know, any prosecution in this country can be stopped any time by any, any Attorney General through the prosecutors, because the Attorney Generals are the chief prosecutors of the provinces and the federal government. Uh, therefore, to, to begin a process of undermining your own rule of law uh, and to su suggest that we somehow can always, um, if it's convenient, um, intervene in these proceedings uh, willy-nilly, uh, I, I think that that's absolutely demoralizing for Canadians. Um, while I recognize that this is a very heartbreaking situation for the two Michaels and the families, and, and I just watched the uh, most articulate presentation by uh, one of the spouses, um, still, the, the point remains that we arrested her under an extradition treaty. We believed we did so legitimately. The court has upheld uh, at least the legal basis of that arrest, and uh, and the, the procedures are still underway. And now some Canadians are saying, well, we should just negotiate with the hostage takers. You know, I mean, China essentially kidnapped these two Canadians. Um, and, and, and if we um, bow to their bullying, we're bowing to the kidnapping by a murderous regime that essentially mistreats not just foreigners, but, but, but its own people as well. And I, I just think that that's, you know, that's what shocked me and that's what embarrassed me when so many prominent Canadians, uh, whom I have a lot of respect for, I know many of them personally, uh, but, but I, was, I was shocked. Let me put to you, Mr. Dessange, how I interpret the position that they're putting forward, the ability of the government to intervene. Uh, the, the legal opinion that they're basing that on is one that separates the role of attorney general and justice minister and says in this capacity, in the capacity of extradition, it is the justice minister who could intervene because this isn't a criminal matter. It's rather a matter of national interest. Basically, the parameters are different than a regular criminal case. That's at least I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying that that's what what is put forward and that given the fact that Trump at one point that the president said, you know, he'd cut a deal. And we know that from, for example, John Bolton's book that resulted in in Meng Wanzhou that them dropping the extradition sort of the need to extradite her uh, that, that at that juncture it would make sense for the justice minister to intervene based on those facts what do you say to that well legally we arrested her appropriately what you're suggesting is because of the foreign government at whose behest we arrested her legally uh, has at the head of it uh, a, a bit of of a, uh, a crazy president uh, who says all kinds of things that we should now undermine our own proceedings, undermine our own rule of law, because the Chinese government, in retaliation, uh, illegally uh, arrested these two Canadians uh, and is using them as, as hostages to, um, uh, to free up Meng, Meng Wanzhou. And I just think that's absolutely inappropriate. You know, who, who are, who, who's the system for? I mean, who are we as Canadians if we can't uphold our own rule of law? If we are afraid of a foreign power and we simply say, because you've kidnapped two of our, two of our people and you may kidnap more, we are going to now bow to you and end our own process. I understand there is an element of politics in the extradition proceedings, but extradition treaties aren't, aren't political documents. They are legal documents. Um, uh, obliging governments uh, with certain legal obligations in those extradition proceedings. The, you heard there uh, from Vina, uh, Michael Kovrig's wife, who, Najibula, Vina Najibula, who talked about, I think, you know, very much understanding that this is complex, that there are, you know, lots of worries about pursuing this avenue. But, but positioned against what she describes as, you know, if you're not going to do this, then what's your alternative action, right? Like, and that is something that is underscored in, in the letter to a certain degree as well, that uh, the government has almost been consumed with what's happening with these two Michaels and with Meng Wanzhou. And, in, and it, that has, in a way, almost erased any sort of foreign policy or, or held them back from being able to articulate a foreign policy 
at China. Do you think that uh, Vina has a point there? Like, do you think that, can you empathize with the idea that, hey, at least this is an option while these two gentlemen are there for more than 560 days? If you're not going to pursue it, what other option will you? Well, I mean, look, it, it is an option. And, and I, I said at the outset, this is a heartbreaking situation. But for every heartbreaking situation, uh, you bow to a bully, you will create many more heartbreaking situations, even by weaker nations and terrorist groups. And you don't want to be at that place in, 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 in our situation as a country. You want to make sure that there is a message to the world that you can't kidnap our people and force us to bow to you. We won't do that. I understand the heartbreaking problems. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not... This is a very, very difficult situation for the Michaels, for their families and friends, and for all Canadians, because we feel for them. But at the same time, you have to, at some point, say, you can't bully Canada into a situation where you essentially arrest two innocent Canadians as hostages and then force us to free Hmong, who's being treated like a princess, lives in a mansion, has security guards, has faced the court, knows what the case is, and has lawyers, the most expensive lawyers, um, at her beck and call defending her through the public court proceedings. And you have China, a dictatorship, that's essentially not even allowing daylight to be seen by the Michaels for the last 500 days, 560 days. It's not acceptable. Okay, I have to leave it there, Mr. Desange. I'm out of time, but I appreciate your time this evening, as always. Thank you. Welcome back to Power and Politics. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau insists he is not going to intervene in the Meng Wanzhou case. The bigger question is whether or not we want China or other countries to get the message that all they have to do to get leverage over the Canadian government is randomly arrest a couple of Canadians. That not only puts Canadians in difficulty now, but puts them in difficulty and in danger in the coming years. We need to continue to be absolutely crystal clear that Canada has an independent judiciary and those processes will unfold independently of any political pressure, including by foreign governments. Justin Trudeau is under pressure to drop the extradition process in order to secure the release of two Canadians detained in China. As you heard the Prime Minister say, he believes folding to China now could endanger more Canadians going forward. So should the federal government do more than simply uphold the rule of law? What are the government's options here? Such simple questions for the power panel. Let's bring them in. Host of the Hurley Burley podcast and partner in the Gandalf group, David Hurley joins us, former deputy of Chief of Staff, rather, to Prime Minister Stephen Harper, former Director of Operations and Principal Secretary to Premier Doug Ford, and now Principal at Jenny Byrne and Associates. Jenny Byrne is right there next to David. Chief of Government Relations for the University of Toronto and former Saskatchewan Finance Minister Andrew Thompson joins us too, as well as Emily Nicolas, columnist with Le Devoir and co-founder of Quebec Inclusif. Hello to all four of you. It's wonderful to see you. Hi, Vashi. Hello. Jenny, I'm going to Hello. start with you because part of the reason the Prime Minister is under a bit of increased pressure to stop this extradition is because of this letter from 19 former, basically, uh, you know, politicians among them, foreign affairs ministers, diplomats uh, from a wide variety of political backgrounds, so different political parties, all saying that he can and should intervene. What did you think of his response today? Listen, I have to say I agreed wholeheartedly with the Prime Minister's response today in terms of, uh, of this letter. I wish he had said it, uh, I wish he had said it uh, before, and I'm not going to get into politics and say that it was uh, part of the uh, uh, UN Security Council, uh, Security Council uh, uh, vote. Uh, it was the reason that he didn't, but I think his response today was exactly uh, bang on. Uh, there is no way that the Canadian flag needs to be a target on uh, on people, and uh, that for governments like China to know that they can get to us by uh, by and if they're in a situation like what they are with uh, with Meng, and of course Huawei is under uh, the extradition is because of. Um, uh, because of uh, uh, Huawei's dealings with Iran, uh, because of sanctions, and so, I, I truly, I totally agree with the uh, with the Prime Minister, and I'm not going to say that uh, any of the uh, 19 uh, people that signed the letter might have business interests with Huawei or other uh, other companies, but I'm saying, you know, 
uh, I'm saying it would be interesting. It would be an interesting uh, uh, topic for conversation. David, what do you think of a the letter and b the prime minister's response to it? I think the letter was uh, astonishing. I, I was quite taken aback by it and quite taken aback by the signatories to it, many of whom I have friendships and relationships with, others I know and respect. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I thought it was astonishing on a couple levels, one of which is, is that Canada, ever since this has happened, Canada has insisted to the Chinese that we have the rule of law in this country, that governments don't just phone up judges and tell them the, what the results of the case are, and the Chinese have not believed that of us. The Chinese don't believe, because that's not the way it works in their country, the Chinese don't believe that we can't just fix this. So now we're going to just turn around and use a legal loophole and fix it? They would have been right all along. They would never believe us again, never believe in our systems again when we tried to talk to them about that. The second thing is it really felt to me a little bit manipulative, the letter, in the sense that it ostensibly was about the two Michaels. But I think if you read the letter, it's really about uh, it's really about foreign policy. And it's really about uh, people trying to push a foreign policy that navigates us away from our relationship with the United States and tries to substitute that with a relationship with China. Uh, I think Jenny's right. I think there's a lot of powerful economic interests behind that. Uh, but I also think that that's a debate that's not been had in Canada. And I know where I would be on the side of that debate. Canada's, uh, Canada's been, it's been our great fortune to be the neighbor of the United States and to have the United States as a superpower uh, that protected us and allowed us to develop the way we have developed. And any future other than that is a weaker one for Canada. And these gentlemen and people who signed it should, these people who signed this letter should understand that. I, Emily, I, I think I, I sort of I completely understand the political arguments that were just laid out, but I also interviewed Michael Kovrig's wife, uh, Nina uh, Vanjibu off the uh, Vanjibula rather off the top of the show. And there's also a really human aspect to all of this. And she was, you know, really articulate in laying out why she thinks the government should intervene. She thinks there is a legal case to be made, but also because. Otherwise, it's not like they have presented a variety of alternative options they could pursue in order to free these two Canadians. Yes, it's very hard uh, to think about those things and really only just make a cold, you know, international relation analysis of this without thinking that those are two lives that are caught in the middle of this. Um, at the same time, it's, um, it's, it's also difficult for all of us, actually, to comment on this because there are a lot of uh, private conversations that are happening that we've been told uh, between the Chinese government and the Canadian government and uh, those conversations are confidential so all of us are trying to make our minds about what's going on but we don't none of us have the full information um, I also think that the the letter that was sent uh, misses two important points it doesn't address them and I think it's it's going it's a point that's very important as well for for one of the Michael's wife is that uh, it's a uh, now that China has laid charges, uh, it's very, it's also a lot harder for them to say, okay, we're going to release them. Those charges were just political. People have been talking about how uh, if Canada, if Canada changed its position, uh, it would mean that the justice system has been being politicized. But for China as well to withdraw criminal charges uh, for spying would also be China saying out loud that their their justice system is just uh, political mingling, which I'm sure they don't want to do as well. So there's there's that, and there's also the letter seems to assume that uh, the United States is the same kind of United States that understood the Canadian position when uh, we withdrew from uh, or or did not go to the I Iraq War, which is you know, where the U.S. is also a very different country, just like China is a very different country. So I think the broader issue is that we are living in a world where the two biggest world power, arguably, are not following conventional uh, diplomatic uh, rules. Uh, they're not following the rule of law. And Canada's kind of caught in all this. And these people like those two Michaels that are going to suffer, but a lot of, not just Canadian citizens, Canadians are probably some of the most privileged citizens in the world. There's a lot of people who are going to uh, suffer from, from that, that kind of disrespect for human rights from big uh, world power in the coming years. 
Some of the names on this list, I just want to make sure because we covered it extensively yesterday, Andrew, but, but just so that our viewers who might not have tuned in know, I mean, everyone from Louise Arbor, Lloyd Axworthy, Ed Broadbent, Lawrence Cannon, former conservative uh, uh, cabinet minister of foreign affairs, minister Hugh Siegel, former senator, Alan Rock, former liberal justice minister. I mean, there's 19 people, Robert Fowler, who himself was held hostage at a certain point. There are a lot of different names that run the gamut of experience. Like David said, I've heard that from so many people that they were, sh they were kind of shocked, right? to see the names on this list. What do you think of the letter? What do you think of how the prime minister handled it? Well, uh, unlike Jenny, I do believe these people are both above uh, reproach. I think that they have uh, offered their advice uh, in what they believe to be the best interest of the country and of the, uh, uh, of the two Michaels who are being held in China. The, the piece, though, that troubles me is that surely these people must have understood that by releasing this letter, uh, they have essentially boxed in the Prime Minister and the government to exactly the response that the Prime Minister had to give today. Uh, there is now very little room. There's a reason why quiet diplomacy is done quietly. And uh, it worries me uh, when I see that particular uh, group of Canadians, prominent as they are, as experienced as they are, uh, feeling that they need to write a public letter uh, to get the ear of, uh, of the Prime Minister. I mean, uh, for Justice or Brewer to have to write a, a public letter rather than be able to access uh, contacts in the PMO or PCO is really problematic. So this whole thing has been so badly mishandled from the first, uh, from the uh, early uh, opportunity the Prime Minister had to uh, divert attention away from this for us not to get caught in this trap of uh, the U.S. and China geopolitics. Uh, now all the way through to this uh, closing off of what really was a last avenue uh, of potential uh, resolve. It's very frustrating. I hope that the Prime Minister's office is really thinking about how they get better advice more quietly brought in. And I appreciate that part of what was happening here is that these people feel that they are necessary to put up a counter-argument to the bombardment that's gone on from people like Dick Fadden and others who have just constantly railed and made the problem more difficult. Uh, to resolve the relationship with China. So, you know, quiet diplomacy should happen quietly, and I think that that's really what we've probably learned out of all of this. What do you think, Jenny, about that point that this really further complicates or limits the options available to the government? Well, uh, uh, listen, I, to go to your point, I can't imagine what Michael Kovrig's mother or, or wife is, is, uh, is going through right now. So I can understand why she, uh, she was... Uh, uh, she has the position she did. The two Michaels, I can't imagine what their family is going to. There is a fundamental difference between what uh, Meng and what the Michaels, the two Michaels are going through is, is Meng is living in a multi-million dollar house in uh, uh, downtown Vancouver where she can go out until a certain point of the day and, and uh, go to dinner and go shopping and uh, and walk around. So it, she, she is different than in the prison-like conditions that the two Michaels, uh, the two Michaels are in. I think... What Vashi, this is going to do is is this is now the the federal government. Uh, I think they were late in the game in making uh, making the statement that Trudeau did today, but I'm I'm glad they did it. I, I I'm I am I am agreeing with where Prime Minister Trudeau is uh, on this today. Uh, but this means we are we are the only Five Eyes country that has not talked that has not made a decision officially at least about uh, whether Huawei will provide uh, five the five G network uh, across the country, and this is. Going going to th this uh, to me the decision has been made so the government might as well come out and say it what do you think it does to I guess the parameters with which the the, the federal government David can maneuver on the, the China file well I, I think uh, Andrew laid it out perfectly right that if their objective was genuinely to uh, get the government to adopt this position they chose the worst possible way in which to do that. The Prime Minister, uh, I thought, looked very strong today. I, like Jenny, I agree with his position. But I also thought it gave him an opportunity to look forceful on foreign policy and sure of his own mind. Um, and uh, disregarding the Council of Elders, if you will, um, who uh, who signed that letter. Uh, I, I, I think the government could certainly look like it is doing more for the two Michaels. Uh, I don't know what it's actually doing, and we're not supposed to really know what they're actually doing. But, uh, you know, there, there, um, there could be a more evident sort of um, focus on, on getting them released or at least uh, doing something for, for their families in, in the interim or something like that. But in the, in the meantime, I, I think that 
we should not underestimate when we ask why a letter like this was written, and I'm not casting aspersions on any one of these individuals, but I am saying we should not be naive about the extent to which China is buying access and buying influence all over the world and is using that leverage wherever it can. And this is a very important issue uh, in China, and I presume they're applying a lot of pressure to people that they know. Emily, what do you think on that point? I agree. I also think that these games that we're playing uh, in terms of in terms of you know political diplomacy with China have a very heavy cost uh, on some some people. And the first thing is I'd like to say is how all we're how we're having this conversation about the two Michaels is very important. At the same time, I think I think it's um, the silence. Of, uh, on uh, what's happening with the in China, there are one million people in concentration camps uh, in the western part of China, and we're having a conversation about arbitrary detention in China that involves all, all the world powers. There, of course, there's also people in Europe who are very interested in, have, in and seeing what's happening with this case because it means that other people who are of Western citizenship might be arbitrarily detained, and that's a very important conversation to have. But it's it's just the contrast with that and the ongoing silence on millions of people are being ar arbitrarily detained at at this time uh, is is uh, it's 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 a little bit bewildering, uh, given the world has been saying you know never again never again never again whenever there has been a genocide and there's something going on right now in China that we're completely silent about, and I'm wondering you know if the time of the 19 very prominent Canadian who wrote that letter. I mean, if we had that kind of public interest uh, with that kind of level of influence, with what's ha also happening with the with the Uyghurs, uh, may maybe the, the game would be different. But just we're having a conversation about how China is able to silence people. But really, the fact that there is this happening inside China right now and the West is completely silent about it, means already that there's something very dark going on in terms of our ability to just stay true to our commitment on human rights. And the other victims of that, collateral victims of that, is that we've seen it with this, with this pandemic, right, already. Uh, Anti-Asian racism, yellow peril stuff is also on the rise in Canada. Whether we're having conversations like that about China, it also impacts people at home that are completely not, you know, related uh, to what's going on. So I think um, we there's just this broader picture of, and I, it's so unfortunate those two men are in the middle of all this. Uh, but but this broader conversation needs to be ha needs to happen as well. Andrew, I'll give you the last word because I have to head over to uh, BC for an update from Dr. Henry. Yeah, look, there's, uh, I forget what the number is, 130 Canadians or something in jail in China for various charges. Uh, Canada's foreign policy is incoherent. I think we know that. I appreciate the exhortation that, uh, you know, we're not doing enough on human rights. I think that is true. Uh, we also seem to somehow forget that we're prepared to fund uh, General Dynamics to send war machines into uh, Yemen. Uh, we don't seem to care about that. Uh, the Conservatives don't seem to be principled at all on that concern. So we're all over the place as Canadians. We're obviously, the government is taking at best an expedient approach. Uh, at some point, uh, we've got to figure out uh, what a principled foreign policy is. Uh, and it should be rooted in human rights, and it should be rooted in the national interest, and it should be rooted in making sure Canadians uh, are protected when abroad. Those seem to me to be pretty simple things. I think that's what the letter was attempting to do as... Um, completely ill-advised as it was. And uh, somewhere between the, you know, the high uh, rhetoric that we heard from the Prime Minister, which I do tend to agree with today, uh, and the ugly practicalities of what needs to be done uh, in foreign policy, we've got to figure out how to reconcile that. Okay, I got to leave it there. I got to head over to BC. Thank you all four of you for your time tonight and your perspectives. Thanks to our power panel, Jenny Byrne, David Hurley, Andrew Thompson, and Emily Nicolai. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.